Thank you, Russ, for that really gracious introduction. It's really an honor for me to be with all of you um, tonight. And thank you so much for the invitation to be with you. And I love the title of your group, Women Witnesses for Racial Justice. Um, as you can probably could tell from my work, uh, much of my work that Russ introduced, um, racial justice is very close to my heart. And it's very important for me to talk about racial justice in light of my Christian faith and in light of scripture. So um, what I will be talking to you about tonight is African-American readings of Paul, Reception, Resistance, and Transformation. It is actually um, the title of my last book. And so we're going to delve into some of the people that I talk about in that book, some of the African-American writers and thinkers who utilize Paul in their protest of racism and segregation. So let's begin. So what was my guiding research question? We're gonna talk a little bit about that as I began to research for this monograph. Um, and my research delves into an aspect of New Testament studies called reception history. We'll talk a little bit about that tonight. We'll look at some pro-slavery interpretations of scripture, um, including the Old Testament and the New Testament. We'll talk about just a few um, examples of how those who were um, for slavery, how they use scripture to justify enslavement. And then for the fourth part of the presentation, we'll look at some particular African-American um, authors and thinkers um, and their resistance and protest hermeneutics in the way they utilize Paul to protest slavery. And then I want to end with a surprise along the way. Some of the things I encountered as I um, did this research and um, some of the things I found, which are, some of them were good surprises and some of them were not so good surprises. We'll talk a little bit about that. But first let's begin with what was my guiding question? for this research. So my guiding question was, how have African-Americans interpreted the Apostle Paul and his letters from the 1700s to the mid 20th century? So how have African-Americans interpreted the Apostle Paul and his letters from the 1700s to the mid 20th century? So that was my guiding research question. And that led me into an aspect of New Testament study called reception history. And I like the way Martin Middlestadt defines reception history. He says, reception history is about rediscovering what the text has meant. So it's about rediscovering what the text has meant and revisiting stories of the scriptures read, interpreted, viewed and performed through the centuries. He also has another way of talking about reception history. He says reception history is about asking the question, what is the Nachleben of these scriptural texts? German phrase there, Nachleben. What is the afterlife of scriptural texts? What is the post-life of scriptural texts? That's, in a nutshell, what reception history is about. And so when we look at reception history, historical contexts matter. When you look at how interpreters interpret scripture, what's happening in their historical context makes a difference for how they're interpreting scripture. So for example, um, one of the people I will talk about tonight is Lemuel Haynes. He wrote his work in the wake of the American Revolutionary War. And so when you read his writings, you can see how he weaves um, the events of the American Revolution into his argument against enslavement and his use of scripture. And you'll see a little bit more what I mean when I say that. But historical context matter when you're looking at these interpreters. And historical context definitely matters when you're looking at how pro-slavery advocates 
are interpreting scripture and how they are reading scripture. So let's look at a couple of examples of um, how pro-slavery advocates were reading Old Testament texts. So um, Genesis 4, a very familiar passage of scripture, is the passage where um, Cain has just killed Abel and God confronts Cain about what he has done. And so he confronts Cain and he asks, what have you done? Your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. I won't read this whole passage, but you see it here on the screen. But what I have underlined is an important um, phrase for pro-slavery advocates. So we know in this text that God punishes Cain by sending him out. And as we see in 15 10b, the Lord put a mark on Cain, the text says, so that no one who came upon him would kill him. Well, I've underlined that and put that in a different color because this particular phrase becomes very important for um, many pro-slavery advocates because what they argued was that the mark that God put on Cain was black skin. And so this text becomes an important text for them to justify the enslavement of Africans. Another important Old Testament text for pro-slavery advocates was Genesis 9, another very familiar passage. It takes place after Noah and his, far and his family leave the ark. Um, you probably know the story well. Noah gets drunk um, and um, his younger son uncovers him and Noah pronounces a curse upon his son. And so I've underlined and put in a different color verses 25 because this verse becomes another important verse for pro-slavery advocates. And so Noah says, um, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servant shall he be unto his brethren. And so this text becomes, again, a very important text for those who are um, advocating enslavement of Africans. So when you think about this is the way pro-slavery advocates are interpreting Genesis, these two passages, which again are very central to their argument, when they get to the New Testament and they're reading um, passages from Paul, servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, such as Ephesians and Colossians. So if they're interpreting those Old Testament texts in that way, when they get to these New Testament texts, they see Paul as merely affirming how they are interpreting these texts from Genesis. So Paul becomes um, a very central figure for the enslavement project for African-Americans. I want to lift up at this point Josiah Priest, who some of you may have heard of. He was a prominent pro-slavery advocate. He was a popular 19th century American writer. And he wrote a book called Slavery as it relates to the Negro or African race. And it's a very interesting book. Um, it is quite disturbing, but it does give you insight into how um, exegesis, if you will, um, was being done at this time to justify enslavement. So Sire Priest looks at these Genesis passages and this is what he concludes. He says, the appointment of this Negro race of men to servitude and slavery was a judicial act of God, or in other words, was a divine judgment. You can see the moves that he's making with this text. The enslavement act of God, right? So he's reading Noah's pronouncement as a, a divine um, ordination, if you will. He goes on to say, as to the intrinsic superiority of a white complexion over that of black, there is no question. By the common consent of all ages among men, and even of God himself in heaven, there has been bestowed on white the most honorable distinction. And you can see here, that, again, the moves he's making of, of the superiority of, of whiteness. 
And he goes on to say, white has become the emblem of more purity and truth, not only on earth, but in eternity also. Black in all ages have been the sign of every hateful thing. So you see here in Josiah Priest, who is not an anomaly, these are very prevalent ideas during this time. You see in this statement of his, this example of white supremacy, if you will, the superiority of white skin, the divine origin of black enslavement. And notice also that he puts on this um, a perpetualness, right? Perpetuity, eternity also, right? Whiteness has the perpetual value in eternity. Blackness has the perpetual devaluation. So it's important when we think about how um, pro-slavery advocates thought and interpreted scripture. For them, it was not just um, an idea that was just about here on earth, but for them, it, would, it included all of eternity, the way they were interpreting scripture, um, their understanding of black enslavement and black inferiority. The priest is just an example but such views, as I said, were prevalent in this time. So he is by no means an anomaly in, in holding these type of views and, and holding this type of understanding of scripture. When you think about the history of this type of interpretation, one of the questions that I, you know, came to me as I was doing this project, then how did African-Americans employ Christianity and the Bible, including Paul in his letters, protest and resist slavery, the slave trade and racism. How exactly did they do that? Let's jump in to try to answer that question. So Lemuel Haynes, who I mentioned earlier, was a very prominent figure in the 1700s, African-American um, thinker and writer. He served in the Continental Army. He learned Latin and Greek. He was ordained on November 9th, 1785. He is the first Black to be ordained in America. And he was a pastor for many, many years. He pastored a congregational church in Vermont. He was a popular um, author, popular speaker, well known for his powerful sermons and writings. And he wrote just around the time of the Revolutionary War, he wrote an essay called Liberty further extended. And so if you think a minute about his context, they, the, the America has just fought the Revolutionary War and they fought for their own liberty. So Haynes says in the title of his essay, let's further extend this concept of liberty that, um, that, that we Americans are so much um, invested in. Let's further extend it to the enslaved among us. And so in this essay, it's really powerful and very beautifully written. Haynes is very skeptical of how pro-slavers are interpreting the ham story. He doesn't really buy their interpretation. At one point in the essay, he says, there is not the least precept or practice in the sacred scriptures that constitutes a black man a slave any more than a white one. Then he goes on to say in that same essay, whether the Negroes are a pain in posterity or not, perhaps is not known by any mortal under heaven. But allowing they were actually a pain in posterity, yet we have no reason to think that this curse lasts any longer than the coming of Christ, when that sun righteousness arose, this wall was broken down. You can see him echoing or um, uh, writing about Ephesians 2.14 in this quote. He continues, Our glorious high priest has visibly appeared in the flesh and has established a more glorious economy. It is plain beyond all doubt that at the coming of Christ, this curse that was upon Canaan was taken off. You probably can hear in this passage, um, Haynes echoing Galatians 3.13, right? 
where Paul writes, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. So Haynes, echoing Galatians 3.13 and also Ephesians um, about the wall being torn down. And it's very interesting how Haynes makes his argument, right? He doesn't really buy how pro-slavery advocates are interpreting the Ham story, but he says, okay, even if, if I grant you that, um, at, when Christ comes, that curse is broken off. So the argument that you're making for the enslavement of, of Blacks is no, no longer holds. You can see that really powerful argument that he's making in that area. I want to turn now to a petition written by some um, enslaved Africans, also close to the time Haynes was writing his essay, Liberty Further Extended. It's a little earlier though, it's 1774, and it's a petition to the governor of Massachusetts from some enslaved African people who are um, writing this petition um, arguing for their freedom and why they should be set free. And as I read this petition, and this is just only a part of it, I'm not including the whole petition, but as I read this petition, see if you hear any Pauline echoes as I read part of their petition. We have in common with other men a natural right to our freedom without being deprived of them by our fellow men. Our children are also taken from us by force and sent many miles from us where we seldom or ever see them again, there to be made slaves of for life. By our deplorable situation, we are rendered incapable of showing our obedience to Almighty God. How can a slave perform the duties of a husband to a wife or a parent to his child? How can the husband cleave to his wife the wife submit themselves to their husbands in all things. How can the child obey their parents in all things? There is a great number of us sincere members of the church of Christ. How can the master and the slave be said to fulfill that command? Live in love, let brotherly love continue and abound. Bear ye one another's burdens. How can the master be said to bear my burden? when he bears me down with the heavy chains of slavery and oppression against my will. A couple of things, I left in the original spelling so you could get a sense of the writing, um, the old English style writing of these petitions. And as I was reading this part of the petition, you probably heard some of the Pauline citations. They are echoing Galatians 6.2. You heard them write, bear ye one another's burdens. These writers of this petition ask the question, how can um, the master bear my burden, right? When he is the one doing the oppressing. They also appeal to the family. Paul's language of husbands loving your wives. And they ask the question, how can we love our wives when we're separated from them? How can our children obey us when we're separated from them? You can see how they are utilizing Pauline language to argue for their freedom and to really argue for the significance of Black family. They echo um, Hebrews 13.1, let brotherly love continue. And they ask the question, how can brotherly love coexist with the wretched practice of slavery? And it's important to note that for them, and during this time, Hebrews was thought to be written by Paul, even though in modern biblical scholarship, we, we don't think Paul wrote Hebrews, but at this time, it was considered um, uh, written by Paul. So they're here again, echoing Paul's words about letting brotherly love continue. These authors, in utilizing this Pauline language, are really um, asserting that the Apostle Paul supports their right to freedom and uphold the declaration that they should not be enslaved to anyone. Petition the governor and other governmental leaders with Paul's words 
the same apostle who had been used to justify their enslavement was a very bold move for these early writers to make. But it demonstrates that they recognized their agency in interpreting scripture for themselves. I want to look at another petition, this time an early petition, 1779, a little later than the one for Massachusetts, 1779, where you have, again, some enslaved African-Americans petitioning the governor of Connecticut for their freedom. And they also utilize Paul's to argue for their freedom. And this is just a part, again, of this petition. They write, your honors, who are nobly contending in the cause of liberty, whose conduct excites admiration and reverence of all the great empires of the world, will not resent for thus freely animadverting on this detestable practice. Although our skins are different in color from those who we serve, yet reason and revelation join to declare that we are the creatures of that God who made of one blood all the nations of the earth. We perceive by our own reflection that we are endowed with the same faculties with our masters. And there is nothing that leads us to a belief or suspicion that we are any more obliged to serve them than they us. So again, these petitioners are writing in the wake of the um, American Revolution, and they are making the argument, you know, America, you are winning the admiration of nations around the world. Therefore, you should be able to understand um, our desire for liberty, just as you are contending for your desire for liberty. And then they make this scriptural argument as well. Um, God has made us of one blood. So this statement echoes Paul's words in Acts 17, 26, that great speech Paul gives in Acts where he declares to his audience unity in God's creation of human beings. This Pauline passage enables the writers of this petition to claim that since God has made of one blood and kindred all nations of the earth, God is opposed to any white supremacy contention for black inferiority. Since God has unified all peoples, all Blacks of this period could boldly declare, just as these writers did, we have the same faculties with our masters. For the enslaved to make such assertions and to place themselves on the same level as their owners, it was very, again, very bold and very risky for them to do, but they did it on behalf of themselves and their um, fellow enslaved um, family members and those in their community who were suffering enslavement. So these petitions are so very powerful and they're very important because they reclaim Paul for the liberation fight. I said earlier how Paul was often used to justify enslavement, but you see in these petitions the reclaiming of Paul's voice for liberation. These petitions are also important because they predate the formal abolitionist movement. You have these early petitions um, asking and arguing for their freedom um, before you have the formal abolitionist movement that we now know about. I want to move now to another important figure, Serena Lee, whom some of you may have heard of. She um, wrote an autobiography entitled The Life and Religious Experience of Jarena Lee, a colored lady, giving an account of her call to preach the gospel, revised and corrected from the original manuscript written by herself. So she wrote this, it was published in 1836, and she was a popular preacher, um, well known for a really powerful sermon. And her autobiography is important because it's the earliest and most detailed autobiography of a Black woman in organized Black religious life. Her autobiography gives us insight into how women during her time resisted conventional roles. 
And her autobiography is also pretty interesting because in it, she details her divine encounters with God, what today we would call mystical experiences, and how these encounters really empower her to speak and preach and proclaim the gospel. In her autobiography, she chronicles opposition to her ministry. She faced a lot of opposition because of her gender, but also because of her race. And another important aspect of her autobiography that I think is really um, beautiful is how she illustrates the centrality of the spiritual practice of prayer. And prayer is, uh, is such an important part of her ministry, an important part of her life. And you can see that as she lays out her life story in her autobiography. She also talks about in her autobiography, her very close relationship with the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit guides her and leads her and helps her and teaches her. And it's really a beautiful, um, a, she really has a beautiful relationship with the Lord, as you can see in her, in her story. In one part of her autobiography near the very beginning, she talks about her conversion experience. And um, I've just put some excerpts from that experience. You can get a glimpse into how she details her encounters with God. She says, three weeks from that day, my soul was gloriously converted to God under preaching, the very outset of the sermon. That instant, it appeared to me a garment which had entirely enveloped my whole person, even to my fingers' end, split the crown of my head and was stripped away from me, passing like a shadow from my sight, when the glory of God seemed to cover me in its stead. That moment, a hundred were present, I did leap to my feet and declare that God, for Christ's sake, had pardoned the sins of my soul. Great was the ecstasy of my mind, for I felt that not only the sin of malice was pardoned, but all other sins were swept away together. That day was the first when my heart had believed, and my tongue had made confession unto salvation. In her narration of her conversion, Lee portrays an ecstatic encounter with God and employs Pauline language to depict a fusion of divine and human will. The glory of God covers her, empowers her, as demonstrated by her physical response. She physically leaps and proclaims publicly her salvation. She talks about how the, the sin of malice was removed and the glory of God covers her um, and, and just enveloped her entire person. Now, after she experiences conversion, she also has a number of different uh, mystical experiences, if you will. And some years later, she receives the call to preach. She also talks about this in her autobiography. She says, to my utter surprise, there seemed to sound a voice which I thought I distinctly heard and most certainly understood which said to me, go preach the gospel. I immediately replied aloud, no one will believe me. Again, I listened, and again, the same voice seemed to say, preach the gospel. I will put words in your mouth and will turn your enemies to become your friends. So Lee seeks confirmation of this. She's very hesitant, as you can see. She's like, Lord, I'm not sure. No one will believe me. Eventually, she gets a confirmation through a vision. God answers her by giving her a vision of a pulpit and a Bible laying upon it being presented to her. She accepts the vision as confirmation that God has called her to preach, and she goes forth to proclaim the gospel. And as I said earlier, she experiences a lot of opposition to her ministry because of her gender and her race. And in different parts of her autobiography, she talks about how she handles that opposition. And one of the ways she handles it, she asks the question, if a man may preach because the Savior died for him, why not the woman? Seeing he died for her also. Is he not a whole Savior instead of a half one? 
Here, Lee appeals to the universalism of salvation for our argument. Salvation is for the woman as well as the man. The preaching can be for both as well. And then she makes this other very, really interesting argument. She says, did not Mary first preach the risen Savior? And is not the doctrine of the resurrection the very climax of Christianity? Hangs not all our hope on this, as argued by St. Paul? Then did not Mary, a woman, preach the gospel? For she preached the resurrection of the crucified Son of God. Serena makes a sophisticated theological move here. She begins with one of the primary tenets of Paul. The resurrection matters to our faith. In fact, our faith is vain if not for the resurrection, as Paul says. And so Jarena says, well, who first proclaimed this? Not a man, but a woman. Thus, such actions provide divine sanction for women preachers. Now, Lee travels as far as Canada and the Northwest Territory to proclaim the gospel. And she becomes well known for her powerful sermon. In 1835, she confesses she has traveled over 700 miles and preached almost the same number of sermons. In the final pages of her autobiography, Lee discloses how after 14 years, she desires to return to Camp May, New Jersey, the place of her birth. And she compares her return to Camp May, Paul, writing, the Lord sent me as Saul of Tarsus was sent to Jerusalem to preach the same gospel which he had neglected and despised before his conversion. So she goes back to Cape May, the place of her birth, and even though she does meet some opposition there, her ministry flourishes and many people are transformed by her preaching. And she writes about how a lot of people come to hear her they were curious to hear the colored woman preacher. She preaches to mixed congregations, um, white and black. And in one of her services, she encounters a slaveholder, changes his mind about blacks having souls. One of the prevalent beliefs in, during this time that um, black people didn't have souls. So, she encounters a slaveholder in one of her meetings, and upon hearing her preaching and listening to her, he changed his mind about that and began to believe that Black people do have souls. She's a very, very important figure. I want to look at one more um, figure. I think time will permit that. Zilfi Elaw, whom some of you may have heard as well, heard about as well. She, like Serena Lee, is a renowned early Black woman preacher, and she writes an autobiography called Memoirs of the Life, Religious Experience, Ministerial Travels, and Labors of Mrs. Zilpha Elaw, an American female of color, together with some account of the great religious revivals in America, written by herself. Now, Zilpha also has a, a very powerful autobiography, similar to Jarena. Hers is a lot longer than Darina's autobiography. Um, but she also, in her autobiography, talks about a, a number of, of divine encounters, mystical experiences that she has with God. She also talks about her attending a number of camp meetings. And during this time, camp meetings were really popular. So she has a, a number of experiences at these camp meetings where people from all over would come together and worship and, and, and having service and preaching. And she um, has a number of experiences during these camp meetings. And so at one particular point, she writes at one camp meeting about an experience that she has. She says, it was at one of these meetings that God was pleased to separate my soul to himself sanctify me as a vessel designed for honor, made meet for the master's use. Whether I was in the body, whether I was out of the body on that auspicious day, I cannot say. But this I do know, that at the conclusion of a most powerful sermon delivered by one of the ministers on the platform, and while the congregation were in prayer, 
I became so overpowered with the presence of God that I sat down upon the ground and laid there for a considerable time. And while I was thus prostrate on the earth, my spirit seemed to ascend up into the clear circle of the sun's disk and surrounded and engulfed in the glorious effulgence of his rays, I distinctly heard a voice speak to me, which said, Now thou art sanctified, and I will show thee what thou must do. As we can see from this excerpt from Elah's autobiography, the way she describes her experiences, she describes it in very similar language to Paul, right? She doesn't know whether she's in the body or out of the body. Paul uses that language in 2 Corinthians 12 when he talks about his ascent to the third heaven. And this, uh, this I, her spirit ascending. And she's overcome by the glory of God. A number of other divine encounters and other personal experiences Elah receives the call to preach. So kind of like similar to Jarena Lee, she also gets the call to preach. And reluctantly, she accepts the call. Again, similar to Lee, she faces a lot of opposition because of her gender and her race. And she talks about it in these terms. She says, like Joseph, I was hated for my dreams. You know, Joseph, who shared his dreams with his brothers, um, so she says, like Joseph, I was hated for my dreams, and like Paul, none stood with me. And so she kind of talks about the loneliness of ministry and how um, Paul, too, was, as Paul was abandoned. So she was abandoned by many when she accepted the call to proclaim the gospel. And she also takes up the challenge of those who would say, well, women should not preach. She says at one point in her autobiography, St. Paul himself attests that Phoebe was a servant or deaconess of the church at Tincrea. As such was employed by the church to manage some of their affairs. And it was strange indeed if she was required to receive the commissions of the church in mute silence. So you can see how Leela is making her argument here. There's no way Phoebe was silent in administering the church's affairs. And as Phoebe was not silent, neither will she be silent. So Zilpha not only takes on those who would say women to not preach, she also takes on those who want to promote Black inferiority. She writes at one point in her autobiography, the Almighty accounts not the Black races of man either in the order of nature or spiritual capacity as inferior to the white. For he bestows his Holy Spirit on and dwells in them as readily as in persons of whiter complexion. Oh, that men would outgrow their nursery prejudices and learn that God has made of one blood, all the nations of men that dwell upon all the face of the earth. In this powerful quote, Tila proclaims that just as God's spirit, the Holy Spirit makes no distinction between whites and blacks, human beings should not employ such differences either. He also uses Paul's speech in Acts. And we've seen the petitioners use this, this passage also. He uses Paul's speech in Acts to underscore the legitimate claims of white supremacy or black inferiority, the outpouring of God's spirit upon black and white, and the one blood that flows through humanity indicate that God created all people, all people as one. These divine encounters that you, that I've kind of lifted up some of them from Ela and Lee, but when you read many of these interpreters, many of them have these really profound divine encounters with God. These divine encounters were religious experience, true, but they had political and social implications because these supernatural events empowered them, empowered them, empowered people like Zilpha to protest the racism prevalent in America. 
and to resist opposition to women in ministry. So these divine encounters were very important, not only in the religious sphere, but also propelling them in social action. Their supernatural encounters were also important because um, demonstrated to those um, whom they encountered that Black people did have souls. I mean, I think it sounds kind of odd for us to have to say that in the 21st century, but for this time, that they would be able to relate these experiences really demonstrated that Black people were human, they had souls, they experienced conversion. It affirmed their humanity and their dignity as human beings created in the image of God. It also affirmed the significance of their Black bodies to God, right? That contrary to what people like priests were saying, their Black bodies matter to God. Their lives did matter to God. Um, and and they're, they're, um, they were called by God and they were anointed and appointed by God as well. So I see that time is, is um, moving on. And so I am going to skip ahead a little bit because I do want to kind of close. I won't look at Pennington and King. Um, I do want to leave time for questions and answers, questions and question Q and A period. So I've only um, a few figures that I talk about in the book. Um, the thrust of the book covers over 20 African-American interpreters from the 1700s to the civil rights movement. And one of the profound things for me as I did the research for this uh, monograph was just the Christian legacy of faith, the way these interpreters interpreted scripture, their, their ability to resist and to transform their own environments in light of their faith in God. And I think these readings demonstrate a hermeneutic of trust. Um, despite how scripture was used to oppress them, these interpreters saw in scripture liberation. They saw freedom. They saw the beauty and the power of God. And so I think when you read how these interpreters are reading scripture, it demonstrates a hermeneutic of trust. Um, these readings display the gospel's potential to bring liberation and really uncovers lost voices important for Pauline interpretation. For a number of people I had not heard of until I started doing this research. Um, and I, I think it's important that their voices be heard. They reclaim scripture, as I said earlier, to affirm their humanity, to resist and protest racism, Proclaim that God's spirit is a transformative power. It has the power to abolish, like to break down that wall that Haynes talks about. And um, to reclaim scripture, to resist division and advocate for unity. Some surprises along the way, as I did this research, I did not realize how much material was out there. There's a lot of material. I naively thought I was going to be able to cover every um, African-American interpreter from the 1700s to the present, talk about naivete. Um, once I started doing the research, I realized that was not going to happen. <laughs> and so I ended up stopping in the civil rights movement. But even with that, I ended up leaving out a lot of people. Um, and again, some hidden interpreters that I mentioned earlier who may not be uh, well known, but who are who are very significant in their time, like Lemuel Haynes. I talk in the book about Ida B. Robinson, another prominent Black woman preacher of the 20th century. And just the ingenious and sophisticated interpretive moves that these interpreters make. I, I was often um, proud and just um, inspired by the way they read scripture, and inspired also by the prevalence of the supernatural encounters that these interpreters um, talk about in their autobiographies. So I think I better stop there because I could keep going, but I do want to leave time for, for questions. Um, I think I better cut it off there, but thank you all for taking the time to listen to this presentation. And thank you again for inviting me. And I hope that it has been informative for you. And I hope that you have been able to glean something from 
these really important figures from our history. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Bowens. That was really enlightening for me. I um, was personally edified that you used some of those um, early uh, black women preachers um, to, uh, and and how they were interpreting the text at the time. Um, uh, future church people know that I work on our website, catholicwomenpreach.org, which has Catholic women preaching for every mm -hmm. Sunday of the year. Mm -hmm. And I often think that they're doing much better theology in their preaching uh, than than our church as as an entity is. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm so glad that that is there as a testament uh, for us. Um, and I'm so glad that you um, undertook this work because, um, you know, in so many ways, it's a documentary history of uh Black Christianity saving white Christian white American Christianity mm -hmm. from itself, um, and really sort of, um, I think, um, allowing Christianity to recapture its authority, which, mm -hmm. of course, right now, <laughs> um, is also in question. So I I can't really um, help but find draw the parallels right now between uh, what's going on with sort of this white Christian so-called Christian nationalism becoming the dominant popular strain of Christianity, um, at least in our politics, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and those of us who are trying to resist all of that. Um, so I'm sure the, the the book is filled with lots of really good lessons for, for those of us who are trying to resist that as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've learned um, so much myself from doing this work. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so let me, uh, I'm just going to click a few buttons here. And I want to let everyone know that if you would like to ask a question to please um, use the raise your hand um, uh, reaction. So if you see that little reaction button down at the bottom, there's the option to raise your hand. And we'll try to get as many of your questions in uh, as we possibly can. And I'll just go in the order that they are raised. You will have to unmute yourself once I call on you. So let's go ahead and we'll get Daryl in here. Let me bring you up, Daryl. Well, thank you, Dr. Bowens, for that. And um, that was really great. My brother actually hit me to this book. Um, oh. Wow. So, oh, thank you. It's very good. Thank um, you. Thank you. I totally enjoyed it. And it just... It was refreshing to see like, what Russ mentioned. I could go on and on, but I'll be quick. So my favorite, what, I was just curious, I, after you did your research, what was like your favorite person or quote or uh, incident that uh, struck you most? Oh, that's so hard. That's a great question, but it's so hard because I learned so much from all of these different interpreters that I cover in the book. Um. Yeah, I, I guess one, one of the ones that I think really, I would say, hit me when I read his, um, his work, David Walker, who I didn't talk about tonight, but I have a piece in the book on David Walker, who, as we know, his work was banned in the South because it was considered very incendiary. He was very blunt about America and America's um, stance on enslavement and what would happen to America if it didn't get it together. But there's one point in his um, appeal where he talks about that because of his boldness, he might end up losing his life. And he uses Paul's farewell speech to articulate that possibility. And I can't say it as eloquently as Walker says it, but that part where where Paul says, you know, I'm ready to be offered up um, in writing to Timothy. I'm ready to be offered up. Um, and he also he also um, weds that speech to Paul's speech in Acts, where Paul tells the this, this congregation, I'm going to Rome. I don't know what's going to await me there. But Walker says, in a sense, I'm ready to be offered up on behalf of the liberation of my people. So speaking the truth gets me killed, so be it. 
I'm willing to die on behalf of my people. And it's when I read that, and I was, and it was just really, really powerful how he weaved Paul's own farewell speech into his own kind of farewell speech, right? And so there's some, you know, discussion and debate about David Walker's death. Some people think he was poisoned. Others, you know, are not so sure about that. So maybe he just died of natural causes. But he, his death was a mysterious death. And so knowing that and knowing how he utilized that farewell speech in his appeal is it's really um, very powerful. I think when I read that, that was one of the ones that really struck me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Daryl. Let's go to Rose Hesselbrock. Hi, Dr. Bowen. This is uh, Rose Hi. Hesselbrock here in Seattle. Uh, wow. I'm just blown away by this very brief presentation. I can't wait to order your book. Um, you. I, I could you. listen to you for a lot longer. So oh, I, thank you. you know, but I, I, I was really struck as you were talking and telling the stories of Jarena Lee and Zilpha Ela, whose names are just musical, right? Mm -hmm. Even just saying <laughs> their names. Mm -hmm. And the, the parallels to the work that women are trying to do now, Catholic women are trying to do now, to allow women to preach and um, to really recognize the gifts of women. And so it's so, in it's so incredibly inspiring to listen to the stories of Jarena and Zilfa, mm -hmm. um, just because they, there are so many parallels. And when you talk about uh, Jarena, you know, kind of talking about St. Phoebe, uh, like, well, okay, maybe Catholics don't know much about St. Phoebe because she's not mm -hmm. in the Roman lectionary, which was a lot of the work that we did this past year. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that really struck me was how parallel the experiences of the conversations um, that these two women had with God were to many of the white mystics. And so I think of Teresa of Avila, you know, really kind of came to mind about yes. how she kind of collapsed or actually was elevated off of the floor. Um, and and I, I just, I feel like it's another example of how there are black women mystics that you know they don't even like make it into a chronology of mystics which is is really a shame so what a gift right that that you were able to um to really highlight their lives and not to make their experience strange mm -hmm. but that you can lay it side by side Teresa of Avila who is now a doctor of the church wouldn't it be mm -hmm. incredible if Jareen mm -hmm. or Zilpha could also be made doctors of the church because of their yeah. encounters with God in there. So yeah, this presentation. Thank you so, so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Rose. Yeah, you know, when I read Jarena Lee's um, autobiography, as well as Zilpha, Therese of Avila came to my mind as well. Yeah. It's like, as you say, there's so many parallels. Um, yeah, it's just extraordinary. And yeah, I think it just shows the faithfulness of God. And and I just love the places. kind of irony in their voices. Like, yes. is, is Christ not a whole savior? Yes. Of a half one? I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. Great, great uh, sense of irony in, yeah. in making her arguments, which was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, these women, they were really fierce. One thing I didn't say about Zilpha and Zarina both, they were born free, but they actually traveled to the slave state to preach. Oh, wow. Which was extraordinary. Um, and Zilpha talks about it in more detail in her autobiography in that she believes God called her and told her to do that. But she goes knowing the risk. Yeah, that she could be captured and enslaved, but she does it anyway. Wow. And she talks about how when she's there in the South, she attracts a lot of attention because everybody wants to come see who is this Black woman preaching. Oh, wow. So wow. these women, they were fierce, as we say, right? They were fierce. Yes, they very were fierce. fierce. I love it. <laughs> they were bold. <laughs> 
Thank you, Rose. Uh, let's see, Dr. Kim Harris, let me get you up here. Yes, thank you so much. I'm very excited about your work and I'm looking forward to introducing my students to your work this semester as we study liberating theologies. So quick question for you. Uh, I saw that you, you said you didn't have time to mention uh, some of the, the ways that uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. also uh, was using Paul. It, are, are there just a very briefly, just a, a couple of things that you could point to, you know, since I feel like, you know, we're still in the glow of celebrating yes. uh, Dr. King. So what, what, what can you point us toward? That question. So King used Paul in a variety of ways. Paul is all over his sermons, his essays, but a couple of things I'll say real quick. So King writes an essay entitled Paul's Letter to American Christians. Okay. And in this essay, he takes on the persona, Paul. He pretends like he's Paul, like Paul wrote to the Romans. Now he, he pretends like he's Paul writing to America. And it's a really beautiful essay. Um, but in that, he, he parallels um, America and he talks about the achievements of America and all the things they've done. But he asks the question, you know, of all of your technological genius, you have really failed to make the nation a brotherhood. Right? You've done all these wonderful and powerful things in technology and science, but you failed to make of it a brotherhood. He also, he compares himself to, um, he goes at the end of that essay, he goes into a paraphrase of 1 Corinthians 13. Uh he does it in such a way that only King could do it, right? He talks about, you know, what Paul says, you have, he tells Paul is telling the Corinthians, um, you have all these things, but you don't have love. And King kind of lays out, America, you have all this technology, but where is the love? You have all this science, but where is the love? And so it's a really beautiful um, essay and powerful essay. But he utilizes Paul, I would critique segregation, emphasize unity. He also uses Acts 1726 that we saw referenced earlier in the petition and in Zephyr's work, but he also uses Acts 17 as well to talk about um, God has made us a one blood. Um, so that's an, another important Pauline passage for King. But yeah, he uses Paul a lot. Romans 12, 1, he uses that in that essay be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't settle for segregation. That's, that's anti-scripture, right? It's not God's will for us to be segregated. God has called us to be one. So he also uses, emphasizes the unity um, aspect of Paul's work. So that's just a little glimpse. I mean, it's much more, but yeah, he, uses, he uses Paul a lot in his, in his work. So oh, thank you. I'm looking for, I'm going to order your book as soon as we're done right now. <laughs> so, but thank, thank you so, so much. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Harris. Let's get uh, Meg Foreman up here. Thank, thank you, Russ. And thank you, Dr. Bowens. Um, Hi. I was in, intrigued by your use of the term, the hermeneutic of trust. Mm. And I, I think you may have touched on this a little bit in your answer to Daryl, and I wonder if it was some of the in some of the materials with regard to the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about the hermeneutic of trust as that relates to the African American interpretation of Paul. Yeah, thank you for that question. So when I talk about the hermeneutic of trust, I'm actually um Barring that phrase from Richard Hayes, who I, I mentioned in the book, he has this phrase, hermeneutic of trust. And I think it's a good description of how these interpreters approach scripture. There is a certain level of reverence for scripture for these interpreters. They do believe it is God's word to them. So there is a posture of trust for scripture, which I think is interesting in light of how scripture 
was used, right, to oppress them, but yet they were able to hear God's voice in scripture for them and to them. So they were not only able to understand scripture as um, promoting their own liberation, they really they believed scripture was for their freedom, was for their liberation. Scripture to them was against enslavement. Um, so they were able to see scripture in that light of liberation. And so this trust towards scripture is also this trust towards the God they believe was that authored scripture, if that makes sense. Like they believed in God and they believed scripture was the word of God. So there was this real reverence and attention to scripture and this understanding that scripture is on the side of the oppressed. Scripture is for their freedom and their liberation and how pro-slavery advocates were reading scripture was not in in line with what scripture was um, should be about or was about. They were, for them, they saw the pro-slavery advocates as a misreading of scripture. Um, does that get your question at all, Meg? It does, Dr. Bones, thank you. Okay, thank you for that question, it's a good one. All right, thank you, Meg. Let's see if we can get um, Mary Ellen McCarthy up. Mary Ellen, give it one more try. Oh, there you go. You're unmuted. Okay. Um, I this was really fascinating and and wonderful. Um, yeah. I I had you mentioned that some of them women were um were not enslaved at the time that they engaged in their activity. Mm -hmm. Was was it was that true of all of them or some of them? Um, it they sound like wonderful stories that I've never heard. Yeah, thank you for that question. So, Jarena Lee, who I talked about tonight, she was born free as well as Zofa. I do talk about another figure in the book, Harriet Jacobs, um, who she wasn't a preacher, but she does utilize healing language in her autobiography to talk about, um, actually, she utilizes it in a way to talk about the plight of Black women. In, in, in slavery. So most of the women I talk about in the book were not enslaved, but they either traveled to the slave states to preach um, or in Harriet Jacobs case, she actually was an enslaved woman. She was the first um, enslaved woman to write an autobiography. Um, and she, she writes it after she escaped um, from slavery, and she's encouraged to write to write it so that people will, in the North will know what is really happening in the South. So she's encouraged to write it, and it's a really powerful autobiography. It's published um, right before the Civil War breaks out, and some people believe that her publication really helped um, in helping people in the North to know that something has to be done about slavery in the South. Um, she, it, it's a, one of my students, whenever I teach this material, Harriet Jacobs' story is often one of the most gripping ones for them. It's also one of the most disturbing ones because she does go into detail of the plight of Black women under enslavement. But she's encouraged to write it um, because um, some some white women in the North encouraged her to write it because they say, we need to know. Women in the North need to know what's happening. And so part of the, in the opening of the book, she makes this appeal to the women in the North. In a sense, I'm paraphrasing, but in a sense saying, come help us. So Harriet Jacob, you know, out of all the women in the book, she's the only one that's an enslaved female. And there are other men in the book who were enslaved, like James Pennington, who I didn't get a chance to talk about tonight, but he was enslaved with escape and um, also wrote his autobiography after he escaped enslavement. Yeah, fascinating stories though, fascinating. 
Thanks, Mary Ellen. Uh, Dr. Bowens, we have two hands raised. Do, do you have time for two more? Great. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Paula and or Ed, I don't know who had the question here. Thank you for your presentation. In talking about the theology of Paul and the approach, is there any reason you haven't mentioned Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, about no distinction between Greek and Jew, male and female, and free and slave? Great question. So when I started this research journey, I really thought I would find that verse a lot more than I have. I'm not going to say that it's not out there because I haven't read everybody, but I've only seen it in a couple of places. So King uses it in his writing, Galatians 3.28. And um, I think it's, I think it is Zilpha who uses it at one point in her autobiography, but it's not, um, it's not as common as I thought it would be. And I really was shocked by that. Um, it appears more in the 20th century writings, African-Americans, but early on, it's not as common. The most common passage is Acts 17, 26, which is really interesting. You see that one, the, the, the one that we saw in the petition, God has made of one blood, all nations of the earth. That one appears over and over and over and over again from the 1700s all the way to the 20th century. Um, but yeah, that's a great question. And I have to admit, I was confounded by that. I really thought I would see Galatians 3.28 more often than I did. Yeah. And thank you so much. We can't wait to get your book. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you thank informed you. us so much. Thank it's you wonderful. so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paula and Ed. Yeah. And let's see, Grace. Let me get you up on the screen here. Good, good evening. As as we're listening, you know, I keep thinking back to the fact that both sexism and racism has been around forever. We for, keep forgetting that scripture says God made us male and female in God's image. Mm -hmm. But man has made God in man's image. And so men continue to think they are God. And the women don't know what they're talking about and don't have it in intelligence. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jesus himself would have been considered a person of color coming from the part of the world he came from. Um, right. But he was the one who sent Mary Magdalene. Uh -huh. He was the one um, that the Samaritan woman was so moved by who went to evangelize her village. Um, even the woman who asked for, for Jesus to give her words and he said, it's not right to take food from, from the, the master and throw it to the dogs. And she challenged Jesus. Jesus himself <laughs> needed to be challenged. She mm -hmm. said, even the dogs get to eat the scraps from the master's table. So mm -hmm. this whole thing is just, the state, as I said, the sexism and the racism has been around forever. And we need we women need to continue, whether we're women of color or not, should not make any difference. We have been called. We too are created in the image of God or the goddess. And we need to continue to push and push and push because the patriarchy does not want to give an inch. Amen. So thank, thank you for encouraging us. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Grace. Yeah, when I read these women interpreters, I see so much of it is relevant for today, right? Many of the battles they face when they detail it in their stories. Um, well, look, look at Hildegard back 1400 years ago. It, it wasn't until 2014 that she was finally recognized as the doctor of the church. 2014. Yeah. What took them so long? Yeah. It's just yeah. unbelievable. She was silenced. Her sisters weren't allowed to receive the sacraments and all this punishment because she spoke the inspiration that she was given by the spirit. Yeah, it's it's. Yeah, Julia Foote, another person I talk about in the book, another really um, powerful Black woman preacher, she was excommunicated from her church yeah, because she followed the call. Um, yeah, as you say, it's, this has been going on a long, long time. 
Um, and yet God's the only one who excommunicate us. And why would God excommunicate us if God calling us to this? Exactly. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Go figure. Thank you, Grace. I always love your passion. So, mm -hmm. um, Amen. Well, I want to uh, thank you again, Dr. Bowens, for really this amazing presentation that I think sparked a lot of uh, questions and a lot of interest uh, in your book. And since you didn't have time to get into everyone that you wanted to get into, I wonder if maybe we can talk offline about doing a part two or something. Well, we can, uh, we can yeah, talk about that. that. <laughs> I'd love uh, that. Great. That would be awesome. Uh, and thank you to all of you for joining us this evening and for um, all of your great questions and, and comments. Um, it's really just a wonderful joy and a privilege to be a part of this future church community. Um, and to walk uh, with you.